Hey there, friends. In today's episode, we're interviewing my friend, Dr. Sandeep Gupta. He is someone who actually makes the world of FDN go round. He's one of our people behind the Medical Director Program. Now, if you don't know, the Medical Director Program is what allows people who are not technically licensed to utilize lab testing with their clients. It's completely legal. It's completely by the book. But it's also one of the reasons that FDN is such a tough, uh, tough course, because we have to have people that are willing to actually get these labs for us. And they're not just going to do that for anyone. They're going to do it for people who are trained properly. So I think it's a testament to the course. And it's also a testament to Dr. Gupta. He's went through FDN himself years ago. He likes what we're doing. And he has his own health story. So he gets it even though he was a traditionally trained doctor. We're going to talk about his journey today through both traditional Western medicine, even though he's in Australia, obviously that would still count as like Western civilization. And then we're going to talk about how he got into the functional side once he realized that when he had an issue, Western medicine wasn't really able to help him. Without further ado, let's get to today's episode. All right. Hey there, Dr. Gupta. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Hey, Evan. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, this actually ended up working out really well. We had tried to schedule with Dr. Gupta before, and then we are we could not be farther away. He is all the way in Australia. I'm on the East Coast of the United States. It's not a fun scheduling thing, so I appreciate you very much coming on at 7-something in the morning uh, for us here. That is, that's dedication to FDN. And for those that are regular listeners, we're not going to get into this first thing in the podcast, but this is a special episode for you guys because so many of you ask that are not doctors, although we do have plenty of doctors that go through the course, how do I get access to the labs? How does that work? And of course, we explain it to you guys that that's through our medical director programs. Now, Dr. Gupta is actually one of those people. He's one of those people that allows the FDNs to facilitate lab orders uh, through him because he trusts the system that much. And again, we'll get to that later. I'm excited for it. But Dr. Gupta is like the rest of us. He had health journey. I am actually not 100% sure of what that was. And you guys know that's my favorite type of interview when I don't really know the health challenges that the person's dealt with yet. So uh, my friend, we're going to start off today with the same question that we always ask on this podcast. And it's a straightforward one. It is what did your health symptoms look like? And, and when did they start? Yeah, so my health symptoms started in 2005, which I guess is going on to 17 years ago now. And I actually was traveling in Oregon there and attending a retreat of sorts, and and there was a gut bug that uh, that went through that retreat, hmm. and uh, as a result, many people went on antibiotics, and I actually kind of set up a makeshift hospital at this retreat <laughs> and treated like you know a few hundred people, maybe four hundred people, wow. and then on the last day of the retreat, I started getting gut symptoms myself. Looking back at it now, I'm not even 100% sure I got the bug. It could have just been the stress of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I decided to take a really strong antibiotic that we had um, sitting there in our dispensary and then pretty much went straight to the airport and jumped on a flight back to Australia or two flights mm -hmm. back to Australia. And when I got back to Australia, I had massive fatigue, uh, fatigue that I'd never experienced before and headaches. Mm -hmm that were very, very severe, and also just gut symptoms. Uh, so I was basically a mess. Mm -hmm. I remember telling my best friend at the time that I'd had a health breakdown. Yeah. And uh, went to see a specialist neurologist at the hospital where I was working. And, he, you know, he, you know he, he looked at me only for about two minutes and he basically said, oh, yeah, you've got cluster headaches. Here's a script for something called prednisone hmm. at a very high dose. And of course, that has its uses. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in, in many situations, it can be life saving. But in that situation, my intuition was just like, hang on, no, there's got to be more to this. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what about the whole story of the antibiotics? And, you know, that didn't even get discussed at all. So uh, I actually just, you know, just went on a journey of reading more about the effect of antibiotics on the microbiome. Mm -hmm and bringing balance into the microbiome. And uh, that was just through internet research. And through that, I was able to basically heal myself pretty quickly. Right. Uh, I then went to a one day program of what was called the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine, which gave me a couple of other pieces, like the importance of getting off gluten mm -hmm. and dairy and sugar. And so I made those dietary changes. And 
actually came good quite quickly, yeah. uh, which, you know, that was really my disillusionment moment with the conventional medical system. Okay. Because, you know, it was like, well, hang on, if it was that simple, why <laughs> didn't you guys just go in that direction? Yeah, and that's a question many of us have. And what's interesting about you is, of course, you know, you did this research and were able to figure it out maybe quicker than the average person um, who doesn't have your background. And I know I read the bio, but it's still worth going into. Before this retreat that you were at with this experience, I mean, what was your life and career like before this? You weren't in the natural space at all, from my understanding, correct? Or is that incorrect? No, I wasn't. I was... No, I was working in intensive care medicine, uh, mainly dealing with post-cardiac surgery patients. And I was working like three or four 24-hour shifts a month. A 24-hour shift? So you worked the whole... 24-hour <laughs> shifts. But you got, to, you got to go and lie down and have a bit of a sleep, like for eight, you know, six or eight hours. So Jeez. it wasn't too bad, really. You get paid for that. And you might very occasionally have one night where you're just up all night with someone really unwell. Wow. What got you into that work? Were you just like a high achiever or did you have a passion for medicine? What, what got you into that? Yeah. So when I graduated from med school, actually during med school, I, I studied Ayurveda just, you know, on the side. I'd always had an interest in meditation and mm -hmm. yoga. And so Ayurveda kind of complemented that really well. And I remember seeing when I was in fourth year medical school, I saw a sign for a holistic medical center. And I thought, whoa, that's a pretty cool idea. I mean, why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't you set your career up like that? And I thought that was that was the intention that I had uh, just before graduating. However, after graduating, there was an extremely strong pressure to basically become a specialist and be adept in the most technological um, versions of medicine, if you like. Hmm. And so that led me, led me to cardiology and led me to intensive care. And even looking back at that now, I do think that that intensive care medicine is where modern medicine shines. <laughs> yeah. you know, basically, be, when someone has a very acute, severe syndrome, and they're basically fighting for their life. And then the ability to be able to put them on a ventilator, give them inotropic or circulatory support, dialysis, all those kinds of treatments are excellent. Cool. There's no doubt about it. Well, and so, sorry. yeah, that was, that was my path up till then. It's people like you that are actually, admittedly, and I say this publicly, you're my favorite to talk to because you're objective, right? You can see both sides. You've been on both sides. I was just interviewing a woman named Kieran Dunstan, Dr. Kieran Dunstan, and she is someone who was just on our Health Space Unmasked program uh, for FDN, and she's an OBGYN. She is someone – you at least – had this openness to it when you saw that holistic medicine thing, right? Maybe it wasn't the path you took, no. but you were studying Ayurveda, you study meditation. No. She had never dove into this at all. And it was her own health issues that eventually led her to thinking outside the box. And again, you guys, the reason that you're my favorite people to talk to is because we need to be objective on both sides. I think a lot of FDNs are really good with this, but there are plenty of people in the natural and functional space, generally speaking, who become very dogmatic. They start condemning Western medicine for every little thing. And I think that's not helpful. I think that's crazy, actually. There are car accidents every single day. People do stupid stuff. They, they get hurt. Um, a a lot of the times, yes, it might be our Western society and modern lifestyles that are causing us so much damage. And sure, if we never did those things, maybe we wouldn't need as much of the severe uh, treatment or the specialized treatment and stuff. But nonetheless, guys, most of us got into functional medicine after a run in with Western medicine. Like we needed that at some point. So let's always be open minded and smart. If my whole thing is this the last thing I'll say is that if the goal truly is, getting the best results for the patients or clients, both sides need to learn to work together. We need to stop arguing each other and we need to learn to work together. Uh, so you had this experience with yourself where now your mind's getting probably opened even more. Clearly it was at least somewhat open before to this if you were studying the things mm -hmm. you were, but now you're really having an experience. So how did that then transform your career and the path that you were taking? Because of course we're talking about a 17 year difference now almost, but even reading your bio today and then hearing the story, there's a dramatic difference from then to now. So, so what happened after that? Yeah, so when I went through that process of getting better through fixing my microbiome and diet and so on, you could say that was just like one big step in a different direction down the rabbit hole, if you like. And so I took another step. I went to that one day of a course, and then I just started uh, consuming information on that side of the medical spectrum. 
whether you call it fun. I don't think they were using the term functional medicine in those days, but nutritional medicine, alternative medicine, complementary medicine, and uh, really just like I had an appetite to know more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was the first thing was just me, myself, learning more and more. Now, they came a point where I started feeling like it wasn't sincere to not be offering that in my hmm. work life. And that was a few years down the track, I think. And, you know, I started using a little bit of nutrition in the intensive care unit, but that didn't go down extremely well. <laughs> and um, I just started then making a plan to transition my career over from intensive care medicine to integrative general practice. And it was, you know, it was maybe a five year process but uh, I think it was a very, very good decision. And that's led to, um, you know, a lot of beneficial outcomes in my life and, and hopefully those of my patients. So it was your own new understanding where you felt that if you were not doing this in some way, basically, it doesn't have to be the whole thing, but if you weren't doing this in some way, it just wasn't being authentic because now you know about this. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. It's like, you know, for instance, if, if someone had a similar problem to me they're getting massive headaches and fatigue due to having antibiotics well hang on you know if you're not going to just go and uncover that piece and very simply um give the balancing solutions that were needed there which are very very low risk then you're going into really risky um solutions that are really not needed and so yeah i just realized that it needed to be part of what I was doing. Otherwise, there were so many people probably who were in the same situation as me. Yeah. I was in the same boat, man. I mean, of all the health issues that I dealt with, uh, one of the things that who knows how bad this got me. I was on 20 courses of antibiotics, some lasting a month or more before the age of 18, right? Whoa. And, it, you know, and then we wonder why I have severe cystic acne and all these other issues, mental health issues, right? Uh, it, it We really... I think I grew up in kind of that final generation where we were still handing these things out like candy and, oh, you have a cold. Okay, well, we'll give you an antibiotic as well, just in case you get a sinus infection. And now, thank right. God, I think most most conventional doctors would never do something like that. We're a little more hesitant because even from a yeah. forget the health thing for a second, we're realizing the societal worldly implications of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Like there are major problems yeah. with just handing these things out yeah. like they're candy. And I'm, I'm curious because... I don't want to just toot your own horn, but I, I think it's impressive when I hear someone like you that was so open to this because you didn't have to even go through the most severe health challenge. It's not like you were diagnosed with cancer and did this. You did this off in you did this off something that in our world many people have dealt with and they don't look the other way. So I gotta ask, in your own words and in your opinion, why do you think so many doctors are resistant? to talking about this kind of stuff or even being open to it because you still had an openness to this even before you got sick. So where does this happen that they're, I mean, you see there's some of the smartest, best people in the world. Why, why does that happen? Well, it's, there's a certain paradigm that conventional medicine have, has at the moment. And um, that is that illness is caused by certain diseases mm -hmm. uh, and you need to diagnose those diseases and take the proven uh the proven treatments, which are generally uh, medication based. Now, anything out of that, and you'll quite co uh, commonly hear like a, a general practitioner say something like, well, there's no evidence for that. <laughs> and, and really what they're saying is I haven't actually looked into that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that, that's kind of the, the general paradigm is that anything that's outside the standard. So let's say you've got heart failure. And there's three standard medications for that. I won't bore you with what they are. <laughs> uh, that anything outside that is just considered to be not, you know, it's not up to the standard, basically. And why would you muck around with um, fixing your gut when that's not the proven treatment mm -hmm. for congestive heart failure? You get me? Yeah. So that's that's the paradigm. And then there's a very strong social and peer pressure to maintain that. So let's say you then move out into a cardiology practice or a general practice where you're, you're working for a practice owner. There's, there's kind of like some unwritten rules, you could say, mm. that get reinforced through the way the doctors talk to each other. Mm. And, um, and, and one of them is you don't go outside the conventional paradigm, generally speaking. 
Okay, that's just yeah. not okay. And if people do that, they're seen as being a little bit foolish or unwise, or you may have to put up with the the snarls of your colleagues mm. or snide comments or whatever it might be. So it's easier to just stay in line yeah, and just maintain this idea that if someone comes in with massive headaches and, and fatigue, it's like, okay, can we diagnose you with a existing um, properly – studied medical condition if so okay you got cluster headaches here we go here's the here's the the, the the accepted treatment off you go kind of thing right sure you know that's it you you fit into the category but you know so so if someone then says well hang on I, i've just been researching the internet and they're talking about it's possible you could have leaky gut and microbiome disruption well again that you know quite simply that just that's outside the model mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's outside the paradigm. So you would simply say something like, well, you know, I don't think there's so much evidence for that. I think that's, you know, that's just, uh, you know, that's just hearsay or, or whatever it might be. And, you know, we've got a proven treatment right here. So why don't you just go ahead with that? And why, why think about these kind of, you know, kind of fairy like ideas? Sure. I think there's, uh, this is actually a problem that bleeds deeper into society than just even the medicine field. And here's what I mean. You said it brilliantly in the beginning of what you just talked about. You said how these doctors, like there's no evidence for that. And you realize, just like yeah. I realized, well, there's actually a ton of evidence for it, but you just weren't taught that. And now they're in one of the busiest careers, one of the most stressful careers ever. Mm. When are they going to sit down and study for another 20 hours a week when they have a thriving yeah. practice and all this stuff going on? And I find that this happens in the real world too. It's almost as if the real world, <laughs> as if medicine isn't the real world, <laughs> the rest of the world, right? It's almost yeah. as if, if this wasn't taught on the news or in school, it must automatically be fake. If it was so real, I must have been taught that. I don't know how no. we've gotten that idea, but that's a pretty dangerous idea that, oh, if it's so important, yeah. it must have been taught to me already. I don't think that's true at all. There's a lot of information out there. And I think that's one of the most frustrating things for people like us. I'm not actually sure who it's tougher for because you're a doctor going away from that normal paradigm. I'm a lay person that has to, in a sense, sometimes debate these medical professionals or people that are being told things by their medical professionals without any medical degree. Um, I'm not sure who it's tougher for, but it is so painful almost when you want to show someone, hey, here are the studies. Here is the actual peer-reviewed literature showing that what I'm saying to you is accurate. And, you know, they're just not going to believe that. So it's not really mm. um, scientific at all so much as it is dogmatic a lot of the times that we just trust these authority figures, we shut our mouths, and we don't say anything. And I th again, I think that's a huge problem even outside of medicine. <laughs> yeah, look, it, it's what you call reductionism. And that's become the dominant paradigm in our society. Mm -hmm. And so one way of explaining that would be, you know, it's uh, the, the, the universe is made up of thousands of different nails. And all you need to do is find the individual hammer for each one. Mm -hmm. And you need, not, you need not consider how they're connected in any way. So if you've got a heart problem, for instance, just find the nail for that and get the hammer and whack that nail in and you're sure. you're off you just get on with life man you know there ain't nothing else to it yeah. nothing to see here so that's reductionism <laughs> as a model which came in you know probably came in around the 20 you know the 19th century and holism would say okay there's a bunch of nails but they actually have a harmony they're actually all tied in together mm -hmm. and you can't actually address one without addressing the whole I love that. That, yeah. that that paradigm was kind of dropped in many ways. Sure. I think we, I mean, hell, you can see it exactly in functional medicine a lot of the times. And I, my gosh, I'm guilty of this myself. When I got into this space because of the health issues I dealt with, what was I looking for? The one diet that would help me, the one supplement, the one alternative therapy. And it wasn't yeah. one nail. Like you said, it turns out that, you know, you had to look yeah. at several different factors. And maybe that's why FDN is, is, is as successful as it is because wording it in the way that you just worded it. Yeah. We're not really taking that reductionistic approach. You know, it could be... Uh, a multitude of diets or different diets at different times, depending on what you're going through. And yeah. we'll figure that out for the person. So that's, um, it's definitely pretty interesting. Now, the last question I want to ask just to try to get your perspective on things. Did you grow up in Australia all your life? Have you been there your whole life? Yeah. 
Okay. I have, yeah. Do you, I'm sure you have you visited the US and you, well, you at least understand the medical paradigm yeah. over here. Okay. Now, oh, with, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've actually, um, yeah, I worked a little bit with the specialist and so on there in Oregon when this outbreak happened. Okay. Called up an infectious disease and I had quite a bit to do with the local hospital. And yeah, I, I, I thought the whole system was pretty bizarre to be honest. Wow. All right. So that's what I was kind of curious about. Are you finding that the same problems that we have in America, because I know a lot of the times people want to blame just like the American pharmaceuticals and the stuff that goes on here. But I think this is like a Western society problem, a, a modern society problem. And I could be wrong. Do you think Australia has the same kind of issues where just, hey, there's a certain paradigm people have to follow it? Do you think America's worse? What, what's your opinion on that? Um, yeah, I mean, in the American system's worse in a sense because it's basically there's no limit to the kind of charges that that you can incur if you have an acute medical mm -hmm. condition, right? And I hear that that uh, medical problems are the commonest cause of bankruptcy there, mm -hmm. which is you know that's that's huge, you know. So my understanding is, let's say you get hit by a car or something and you're not insured, you could be up for hundreds of thousands of dollars for you know, a few days in intensive care or whatever it might be. And and one of the problems, my understanding, is that there's no end to the number of scans and blood tests and other tests that the doctors will do because there's there's no incentive to just, you know, to to stop somewhere. Yeah. While you know, while in in the other in the systems like the Australia and the UK where people have a basic le level of medical cover on the government, uh, there, and there's a public system versus a private system. The public system does seem to have a bit more of a stop sign to it where people are like, hang on, no, we don't need to do another MRI here, you know. <laughs> there's basically been one. We've got our diagnosis. Let's just stop there. And no, we don't need to do anything more. We've just got a standard of care. And so, yeah, you could say that, you could say that there is some, there does need to be some control and stop sign over that. Um, over, over just the, yeah, the acute medical care. Otherwise the, the costs can just get huge and out of control. And, and then I think it's just, there's just so many times types of insurance schemes and so on out there that it's extremely confusing. And my understanding is sometimes you don't know whether an insurance company is going to pay or not. You've got no idea really. <laughs> yeah, and so... <laughs> It's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit more of a confusing system. While over here, let's say you get admitted into a private hospital, the first thing is, is a quick check on, okay, is your health fund going to pay or not? And, you know, that, that's, that's the end of the story right there. If you get a yes, then that's, you know, that's it. They're going to pay for everything other than a small excess. So, yeah, look, there, there, is, there are problems with, with the American health system, I think, but there's also positives, and that is a much more free market system, and therefore... Uh, people are able to access um, other choices much easier than in some countries. So one, one, you know, one family member told me out in Canada, you've only got a certain medications you're allowed to use mm -hmm. as a registered doctor, and anything outside that's not covered. So that restricts things a fair bit. And so I guess, I guess at the end of the day, it just means that you just got to move towards a cash type practice if you want to go outside the the norms. And that's what happens a lot. I mean, the chiropractors out here, for example, there thankfully are some manipulations and therapies that they use, which are covered by insurance now. And you can come in, you play, pay a small copay, and that's it. But the chiropractors that are doing things from a more functional perspective or want to really go outside the box or offer alternative therapies, which is most of them. Yeah. Chiropractors out here, like you're paying them cash. This is going to happen to a lot of the naturopathic doctors or the functional medicine doctors as well. These are cash things. And perhaps um, the only good thing about the American system being so damn expensive nowadays is it makes it easier for people to transition to the functional side where they do have to pay cash because they were already spending so much damn money on the uh, Western side and it wasn't working for their chronic. Right condition uh that maybe it's not as bad of a transition but yeah ideally gotcha. it, it'd be wonderful to live in a world where people don't have to spend such an insane amount on these types of tests and all this stuff but we're just we're, we're not there yet it's something around like 48 percent of americans don't even have a 500 dollar um you know savings basically for an emergency or whatever. Well, if they don't even have a $500 right. savings, what are they supposed to do with the medical bills? What are they supposed to do to get the functional lab testing that might be necessary to restore their health? Uh, it's tough, man. And um, 
I think what we're doing is exactly what we need to be doing. Yes, it's higher ticket rate now, but we're out here spreading the word. There are plenty of things that people can do without ever having to use a functional lab test, right? Well, at FDN, guys, we no. teach dress. It's diet, rest, exercise, no. stress reduction, and supplementation. And you'll notice supplementations last. Those other four things are free, right? You don't ever have to do or pay anything to do those other four. And we always teach those yeah. at FDN as well. But um, we, we get into that another time. I'm curious about going back to your story and your journey with this and how this has led to a changing practice. And I thank you for your perspectives on this, the world and what's going on. Um, I think that's interesting and a little bit of a change up from what we normally talk about. When you were doing this research and discovering new things that worked for you, were you shocked by this or did it make sense given your history of like diving into Ayurveda? Was it just more of a confirmation of things that you had learned in the past? Because I know for many of us, it's literally shocking when we realize it works. I think there was a shock, shock factor there mm -hmm. just to realize how profoundly, uh, for instance, that my gut was involved in my symptoms. You know, I think it would be fair to say I probably wouldn't be surprised if there was a little bit of a connection there, like maybe the gut was amplifying things or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, it, it turned out that my gut was virtually 100% the cause. And yes, that was very shocking. You know, I, I had the experience at one point where I could just switch off my headaches by taking glutamine <laughs> as a supplement. So it was, you know, that's what it was. It was the leaky gut. Wow. And yes, yes, that was, that was quite shocking in a sense. And just yeah. going through that process, recovering without using any prednisone, um, it was, um, yeah, it, it was very, very surprising and very eye opening. And, and as you could see, the, the reason I then started, you know, I was going pretty much straight down the conventional paradigm <laughs> and I started taking a 90 degree turn at that point. Uh, so yeah, it, it was, it had a huge effect on my life and career. Wonderful. So what do you find? Uh, like, did you have a, a in-person practice now that people can come to in Australia, no. correct? Well, first mm -hmm. of all, shout no, that out. We'll at shout it. it out again at the end, but I want to hear it now so people know. It's called Lotus Holistic Medicine. It's on the Sunshine Coast in Australia. And we see people with all kinds of chronic illness. Okay. And well, that's what I was going to ask next. I mean, what are the typical cases, if there is any typical ones, that you're seeing when people finally get to? Because you, I'm going to guess you're not the first person they go to, unfortunately. Correct. Yeah. So look, when I first started up, which was in 2011, uh, in my own practice, I got people who had somewhat milder conditions, you know, fatigue, a bit of, uh, you know, maybe some headaches, maybe some gut symptoms, but it was all pretty mild. And I started off just using totally a nutritional approach. Uh, I also used kinesiology quite extensively. Mm -hmm. And what I actually experienced was that there was a group of clients that just got better the first group of clients, they just got better and they left. And then I got a new subset of clients who seemed to not respond to just a basic nutritional approach. Mm -hmm. Now, around that same time, I had a house flood uh, in, in, in Sunshine Coast here. And my partner at the time became very unwell. So that led me looking into biotoxin-related illnesses and and mold-related illnesses specifically and contacting Richie Shoemaker and joining up to his physician training. Now, interestingly, at that same time, I was starting to get more and more difficult uh, clients. And so I started looking at tick-borne diseases and running tests like Igenex and starting going to seminars on that. And basically, what I learned in order to assist my partner at the time was the same information I needed to help my clients at the time. And it was starting to learn about biotoxin related illnesses, mold, Lyme, and mast cell activation and, and things of that nature. And all of a sudden there was, and when I got certified, there was a massive influx of people who wanted to look into mold related illnesses. And I couldn't believe how many people sought me out at that point. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so, so since then I've started getting more and more complex cases until now, I tend to be one that, that people come to after they've seen 10 or, or 20 other doctors sure. and say things like, 
just want you to know, Doc, that you're the last one here on the list. <laughs> yeah, and it's unfortunate, <laughs> right? Because typically we're the ones that can help them the most. Not that I'm a doctor, but FDNs, we get the no. same thing. Are, are you kidding me? It's the yeah. fact that I'm not a doctor. I'm really the last person on their list. Right? It, it's like, right. all right, we'll, we'll give this kid a chance. And then all of a sudden, this is actually the thing that worked most effectively for them. So it's a shame that they yeah. have to go through uh, so far through the system before this happens. I mean, and especially these more complex cases nowadays, like what does Western medicine even do for this because i'm assuming they're not identifying the mold stuff they miss lime half the time what are they even doing yeah. for these people are these people coming on medications that they shouldn't even be on i guess yeah look i think it does still have a role mm -hmm. you know i think it needs to you know there needs to be a process of excluding any autoimmune or connective tissue disorder and making sure that there has been a thorough process um, of exclusion but then once that's been done and they found someone with a multi-system illness, they basically then need to, and we're actually looking at this with the government in Australia, there needs to be a diagnostic process of, is this a mold-related illness? Is it a tick-borne related illness? Mm. Or is it just, you know, what we call a standard chronic fatigue syndrome, which has got a huge uh, overlap, of course, with, <laughs> with what I just described before. Um, but, you know, they've got to get some basic things. And then ideally in, in a system that's working well, they would refer off to one of us who's dealing with um, these kinds of illnesses and that would then that would then be a much more functional system how do you think that's going to go do you think you guys are going to be successful in convincing <laughs> convincing the government this is uh, necessary we've still got a uh, we've still got a few challenges there mm -hmm. and uh you know, even if we can get partial buy-in on that, that's still a start. And we're actually now running a research study, which they've um, they've granted the NHMRC, the Natural, uh, National Health and Research Medical Council of Australia, have um, granted $1 million to do a research study into mold-related illness here. Right. So we're hoping that the results of that will help to then, uh, to then basically move the system towards understanding mold-related illnesses okay. and uh, being willing for, for general practitioners to refer to, to doctors who are, who are expert in this area. How many people do you think are walking around? Uh, let's assume that they have chronic symptoms. How many of those people do you think are walking around with mold-related stuff and just have no idea that that's even impacting them? It's, it's a lot. It's definitely a lot. Uh, Scott McMahon, uh, who's there in Roseville, New Mexico, uh, basically wrote a study where he said somewhere around 11 to 13 percent of the general population, which is what America is, what, 330 million people. So you're looking at more, you know, somewhere around maybe 35 to 40 million. You know, that's a lot of people. Yeah, I'm That's thinking a of, lot of folks. I'm thinking about something like the state of Florida, where it's estimated that like 80 plus percent of the homes have some kind of mold damage because it's very low elevation. Florida hosts like 22 million people, but the highest point in all of Florida is only like 380 feet above sea level. So anytime, really? there, yeah, yeah, it's the um, lowest high point of any state, and. And it's a huge state. That's what's funny. It's very large, but it's just low. And then you have the Everglades National Park. You got hurricanes mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, my friends live in an apartment complex that is built with solid concrete. The Wi-Fi signals don't even go through from the neighbors because it's that solid. And they have to do that because the hurricanes will come and just absolutely decimate the place. Now, that's great that they're worried about the hurricanes, but people don't really think about the after effects of that. It wasn't just the hurricane mm. itself. It's the water damage that it's going to lead to over time. And you get these homes that look absolutely beautiful from the outside and even the inside. You tear up those walls and this person or persons had black mold in their house and or some other mm. kind of mold. And it can be uh, it's pretty serious stuff. I don't think enough people know about it. I do. Um, I, I tend to believe that it's not for everyone, but it's one of the side effects of today's world because we walked around with mold all the time. There's mold everywhere when I go outside. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm inhaling those spores, but it shouldn't always have this terrible effect on us. But when we're inside, we have all the other aspects of today's modern lifestyle. That's, it's just one more thing that's on top of this. So where are you even, where do you start for these clients? Because I know that before you had said you were focusing more on just nutrition and then assuming you transitioned out of just that at some point, do you run certain labs on every single client or does that, is it uh, different labs for different people? Like how does that work for you? Different labs for different people. Okay. And I put a lot of emphasis on the history and just the questions and the story that you get. Mm -hmm. 
And usually I try to be able to ascertain whether someone's likely to be affected by mold and dampness just from the story. And I try not to put all my um, all my eggs on the testing, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And, and I really, what I try and do very consciously is work out what question am I trying to answer through any particular test. And I do see this a little bit uh, in the functional medicine world as people go and run a urinary mycotoxin test, for instance, and they're using it to answer the question, does this patient have a mold problem? And I would say, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, 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 no. (laughs) That's not how you use it. You want to basically, you can use it to answer the question, how well is the client excreting mycotoxins right now and which particular mycotoxins might be involved? That's reasonable. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you've got to get to the stage where your, your history taking or your question, you know, questionnaire and um, your interview with the client is sophisticated enough to be able to answer that question mm-hmm. already. And then you're just using the test to answer specific questions. So for instance, if I do an organic acid test, it's more about um, complications. Is there actually mold infection going on or candida infection going on? Is there an elevation in oxalates? Is there uh, mitochondrial dysfunction going on? Is there deficiency of various B vitamins due to the oxalates and the fungus? Is the glutathione pathway thrown out? Those are the questions that I'm uh, I'm using it to answer, and I think it's really useful to always ask that question: What am I looking for from this test specifically? Okay, cool, very interesting. How did you get involved with FDN? Like, how did did you meet Reed Davis somewhere? How did that work? Yeah, so I got involved firstly in something called metabolic typing. Okay, so <laughs> I did my masters of nutrition way back in um, in two thousand and eight through to 2010, I think it was. And one of the things that Dr. Gabriel Cousins, I don't know if you come across him, but he did talk about metabolic typing quite a lot. And I went back and looked at, at the original research that he quoted in his book, which was called Conscious Eating. And it was actually Bill Wolcott um, that was quoted. And so I went went and, and looked that up and, and contacted Bill Wolcott and to find out about how his metabolic typing system worked. Hmm. And it was actually quite a simple process to sign up as a certified metabolic typing advisor. So I did that and went through that process. And uh, and then that allowed me to be part of the metabolic typing forums. Okay. And they were great. They were great, man. They were on Yahoo at the Yahoo forums at the time. <laughs> And uh, there were some really, really gun people there, including, you know, Michael McAvoy, who's become a long-term friend of mine, and none other than Reed Davis. Mm -hmm. And I believe I was actually on there when Reed actually started Functional Diagnostic Nutrition and started talking about it, which was just a face-to-face thing initially. But slowly he rolled it out as an online program, and I got to know him, and I signed up for the course and did it and found it very, very useful. And slowly, slowly we built a relationship and a friendship. And I think a few years afterwards, can't tell you how many years, but I think it was probably 2017 or so, he he called me up and asked if I'd like to be one of the medical directors. And I was honored to do so. And uh, I'm glad to say I've been able to contribute in a small way to the development of FDN and and the introduction of things like SIRS and stealth infections and so on. And it's been a lot of fun. Been to San Diego for the conference as well once. Oh, nice. Oh, cool, man. I'm kicking myself because what do we do? We always tell ourselves, oh, we'll get it next year, next year. And then a global pandemic happens and shuts everything down. I'm like, I will never, ever, ever miss an FDN conference again. I know that for a fact. So um, it'll be great to hopefully meet you one day there. And I think what you just said says a lot because we just prefaced this whole thing indirectly by talking about your experience with conventional medicine, your own health symptoms, all the different things that you studied. And then you still end up going through the FDN course, you like it, and you stuck around with it for a while to the point that Reed ends up calling you up. And I know that this isn't necessarily your role to explain, I understand that, but I still would love to hear it from you because I think it's helpful to the people listening. And we promised them in the beginning, we would talk about the medical director program. The biggest question they get is, well, how does this work? How can I, like, I don't have a degree in any type of medicine. I don't have even a bachelor's degree in it. And yet I can facilitate lab orders. I've seen your name on some of the things that I've uh, used. So can you explain to people to the best of your ability, like, how does that work? Why is it legal? Why is it allowed? Because what we're doing is completely by the book. 
Yeah, that's right. So basically, you know, I am a, a totally registered MD, mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm able to run even US labs. Mm -hmm. And what we've basically done is created an arrangement where you guys are basically latching onto my license, and I'm I'm seen as supervising everyone. And, you know, through the processes we've developed and the training, because we quite clearly explain where the limitations are and when referral is needed to a medical doctor, I, I believe it's safe uh, for you guys to have access to these labs. Mm -hmm. So, and I actually think in some cases it's more safe because you've got clients who are not willing to go to a doctor <laughs> and you're able to do a bit of a screen and say, hang on, man, you've got, you got a really low hemoglobin there. You haven't had any blood tests before because you don't go see doctors. Um, this is a case where you actually really need to see one here. Let's go and have a look at who's actually a, a really friendly MD in the place you live. And let's, let's, let's check this out and make sure this pathway is going to be okay for you. And you can lead people down a pathway that otherwise they were afraid to take, but they really need to take. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe it, it, it's a it's a safe way of operating. And basically, you guys are then able to just run some some simple things. So, for instance, there's the cardiovascular wellness panel. If someone's worried about heart disease or they have existing heart disease, we've got the SIRS basic panel and uh and and the more extensive one now one of the things about that let's say someone has worked out that they've got very significant mold problems mm -hmm. sometimes it can take six months or a year to get into what we call a a SERS certified physician mm -hmm. let's say you know like dr scott mcmahon i mentioned before so in the meantime you guys can save them time and energy by having the labs done mm -hmm. and so by the time they get there They've already got some labs done. They've already done some preparatory work. They've started getting an inspection done. They've got on some basic binder support, et cetera. And that's going to streamline that process so much. Yeah. And so, so I think overall it can be very, very beneficial. Um, we've also got the mental health um, panels there. Um, there's, a, there's a whole range of panels. I actually use it myself all the time with my US cool. clients, and it's a very efficient service. So it just gives you guys the ability to complement the other things you're doing, such as that basic functional testing with some more conventional lab testing, mm -hmm. which you know, it, it marries in really well. So for instance, it's not easy to test the thyroid any other way than doing a blood test. Sure. So being able to get those labs back in combination with, for instance, the cortisol results that you generally mm -hmm. do and some gut tests, well, it just gives you a more thorough picture. And yeah, through that, you're able to assist the clients even more. And if the assistance you're meant to give them is, well, actually, you need to go see a doctor, then that's fine too. Yep. They'll, they'll actually totally thank us for that because that's the right path for them. So just to be clear then, because I think this is a perfect explanation, when you are doing this though, even though this is completely legal for us and you, you are still taking some risk. So you are objectively saying that you trust FDN and the certification process enough that you're going to put your name on this for technically thousands of graduates um, in addition to the other medical directors. So you are saying that, hey, I trust this enough that I'm going to do that. Yeah, that's right. And I myself have been involved very much in the training mm -hmm. and at each step explaining to people, hey, you guys, just know where your limitations are and know when the point is where you go, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yep. Um, I can see some medical intervention is needed here. And, you know, try and make some good connections in your area or and around the states with medical doctors if you can, because it's so much better if you can say, hey, I've got, you know, I've got Dr. Bernstein or whoever it might be. Mm -hmm. Uh, who I know, and he's a great guy, and he can see you over, you know, over the phone actually, or or over Skype or whatever it might be, uh, even though he's in a different town. Mm -hmm. And you know, I know the guy; he's really cool. He understands what we're doing, and he can give you all the referrals you need and and get some further testing done. You know, perfect. Yep. You know that that's the kind of that's the kind of arrangement that works well for everyone. I think. So that's I what I encourage uh, FDNs to do. Yeah, and I know it might seem simple, but I can't tell you how much that explanation means for the audience because I can say it a million times. Um, it means a thousand times more coming from you with your years of experience. You don't have to be doing this. You went through the course yourself and you went through it 
at an okay time, but let's be honest, it's only gotten significantly better <laughs> since you went through back then. I mean, it's, it's certainly a different course from then. Um, I think that says a lot when people are willing to do that. And guess what? We don't really have many problems. I don't, I mean, I'm not in that side of the business. I don't know of any problems, major ones that we've actually had. People go out, we do this work and we're trained to do it correctly. There are times and places that I can really help someone. There's other times and places where, hey, yeah, if you're a basic example, if someone a cult, uh, if someone's a cult blood comes back as like an eight on the GI map for me, I am referring out that to a GI specialist every single time just to double, double check. And then, you know, it's cool, guys. You go there, they double check it. A lot of the times it's nothing. They come back and bam, they can do the rest of the work with you. You keep focusing on that holistic stuff. But no, what we exactly. need to be doing um, – work that incorporates everyone. We need to be having more conversations like this. And again, I said it in the beginning, I'll say this a million times more. If doctors or functional practitioners or both are truly interested in the best results for their patients and clients, then we need to all work together. Otherwise, we're just letting ego get involved and we're just fighting each other back and forth. And I don't think that's really a good idea at all. Um, and just to be objective, it annoys me just as equally when a functional practitioner is hating on Western medicine as if it's the worst thing in the world. I think that's ridiculous. And then I ask them, well, is your objective here to get the patient or client the best results possible? Because then you have to use a little bit of both most times. And that's completely okay. So let's get the ego out. Let's stop fighting back and forth. I know Western medicine has hurt some people. I get it. I know there's some quack natural people that have hurt people. I also get that. Uh, we need to learn to work together. There's really good things on both sides. And that's that's the future, hopefully. Now, um, I want to spend the last few minutes. I have a final question for you, but I want to talk about where people can find you, uh, who can reach out. Because you even said that you have US clients. So I actually didn't know this. You're taking people in person then and online, I'm guessing as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. And generally, you know, the people who are the US clients are ones who have gone through some of my course material. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, yeah, so you can find me at lotusholisticmedicine.com.au. That's my clinic site. Uh, and then moldillnessmadesimple.com is where you can find my online course on mold illness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's around about 17 hours. So if you guys want to do that, it's, um, you know, it's probably a couple of months of working a couple of hours a week and you can get through that. And it's, it's a relatively inexpensive course. And it's a great thing to do in combination with FDN mm -hmm. because it just gives you that other little small piece. Um, while FDN is kind of the big picture, yes. this is just one, you know, this is one particular small area which may be useful. So there's those two. And then there's just all my links are just at drsandeepgupta.com. That's just a small link tree site. So th those are my main websites. Okay, thank you. And I love how you kind of called it the big piece because that's so true. And just to be clear for people, if we, it's not that we're specializing in anything as FDNs, right? We would be no better than the stuff that you were talking about in the beginning. But let's not be ridiculous. Some people have interests that outweigh other areas of functional healthcare, yeah. um, and that's perfectly fine. Some people have niches for the sake of business. You could be doing fundamentally similar things and have a different niche for your business. It's not the same as specializing. I have the topics I love learning about, like light's a huge one for me, blue light, red light, all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, kind yeah. of the dangers mm -hmm. of blue light and the benefits of red light, rather. Yeah. I, I no. love all those things, and I can do that, but I can still do the core big picture stuff of FDN while doing that. And similarly, I think there's a lot of people out there, Dr. Gupta, that are very interested in the mold side of things now. And I think that's because, unfortunately, I've heard devastating stories of people spending tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, trying to figure out just what the hell's wrong with them. And once they figure it out, there's another 50 grand. They got to re um, redo the house. Yeah. They got to spend the money on the healthcare stuff. So I, I can imagine many people would be very passionate about learning more about that. And I'm glad that that can be done with the FDN course. Now, one question I got to ask you before we head off for sure, uh, my second to last one here is do you have, well, I know that you do have this, but could you share maybe a client testimonial that's just maybe very close to your heart or one that really stands out? I know that you've worked with many people, but I, I think that's one of the best parts about doing these interviews is getting to talk to people who have actually helped others and maybe changed their whole mm -hmm. life around. And they came to you and that was like, uh, that was it for them. That's what they needed. Yeah, probably one that comes to mind is one that I presented recently in another presentation, which is a, a client who was affected by a, a mold 
um, a water damaged building, if you like, one which had a, a high level of mold and dampness. She'd come up from Sydney and we did our standard uh, treatment for CIRS, if you like, or support for CIRS, which included binders and uh, a bunch of other supplements and so on. And then finally culminating in VIP. And one of the in really interesting things that happened is during that process, she got a lot better, but then a lot of her emotional trauma came up. Hmm. And she started then realizing she needed to work on that. And so she spent a few years really working on some of her emotional trauma from childhood. She did limbic system retraining. Mm -hmm. She did vagus nerve techniques. Mm -hmm. She did a whole bunch of other things. And finally, finally, we're finding there's that she's coming good again. But I think one of the things for me that's so powerful about that story is it's not just about that particular illness itself. It's actually helped her to address like some of the really big picture things in her life. Hmm. And my hope is that her life will be totally transformed after all of this and she'll have a much more open and deep experience of life. Um, and that for me is very exciting yeah. to see that there's a whole transformation that's taken place. It's not just, you know, people getting better. That's only one part of the, the puzzle. The other part is how much has this changed you and grown you? Mm -hmm. And I love hearing about that. Yeah, it's um, it's one of those things that just makes this work not really feel like work. It's one of the coolest paths yeah. to get to go down. And I know none of us would choose to have our health issues necessarily, but man, the other side of this, getting into this space and doing the work that you're doing now, I'm sure you wouldn't change it, right? It's just one of those things exactly. where yeah. um, I, I know so many people, especially as a younger guy, you know, a lot of my friends got out of college two years ago. Some of them are graduating with advanced degrees right now. And they're following a path that might pay very well and might be fulfilling in a sense, but you know, they're not happy. They're, they're not doing something that lights them up. And I think that's my biggest gift. I would never ask for my health issues, but I also wouldn't go back and change the 13, 14 years of things that I dealt with because it made the rest of my life more amazing than I think most people will ever have the privilege of knowing. Um, just getting to talk to you like, oh yeah, this is work, right? I get to interview some cool guy from Australia that helps us out at FDN. Yeah, that's really work, right? <laughs> no, I love all this stuff. I think it's it's amazing. Um, obviously, we'll have all of your links in the show notes and I thank you for your time today. Now, we will finish up though with the signature question of the Health Detective Podcast. It's not a trick or anything. Thing. It's actually kind of simple, but it's depending on the person can be complex in its simplicity. And the question is this, if I could give you a magic wand and you could get every single person in this world to do one thing for their health or stop doing one thing, what is the one thing you would get them to do? Wow, that's a great question. And to be honest, I've never thought about it. But right at this moment, I'm going to go with meditation. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is I believe that just from doing that and from getting some more stillness within and getting a, a, a rising consciousness, that it's likely that other things are going to come from there. Hmm. And that's why I'm going with that rather than saying something like just eliminate gluten or just eliminate <laughs> sugar, which are, of course, hugely important. There's no doubt about it. But I would say if they brought in that one habit, of just doing meditation regularly, that it's likely their consciousness will grow and they'll start realizing these other things um, in due time. 